Okay, thanks for joining. Uh, this is John Day. Today's Friday, March 11th, and we're going to cover some recent articles. They're actually not that recent. They're from like, I don't know, maybe this started back when um, the IRS was collecting information from Coinbase and some other, a couple other exchanges. And so I'm going to give you my theories on this, and <clears throat> we're going to talk about some articles I had published right about that time about letters that were sent out, those 10,000 letters where it was like, um, I think it was form letter 6172 and 6174, if I remember correctly. And they've got some other form, letter, form numbers. I didn't know that uh, there were some other ones, but I just want to go over that. So um, if you can see here, I'm showing you, well, let's go over here. I'm going to go look over here. So here we go. So I just, um, you know, this came up a, a few times and you can see this came up a few times this week for some reason, but this article is from 2016. This is before I believe that IRS defined cryptos as property. So what they were trying to do is see what they can get away with. I think the Department of Justice was trying to see what would happen. And then of course, when you push people, you know, thousands of people, you push them a little bit, someone's gonna, someone's gonna fight back. And sure enough, this guy named Harper decided to sue the IRS because he said it wasn't fair that the IRS got his information without a warrant or something like that from Coinbase. And so they're trying to use this third party rule, the IRS is, the Department of Justice is doing this to try to create, I think they're trying to create some case law to say, hey, it's cool, we can, we can take whatever information we want anytime we want and you can't do anything about it. And I think it's cool this guy tried to do something about it. <clears throat> but at the same time, I mean, this came up in 2018, I believe. And everybody was asking me, John, what happened now? They have this, I got this form letter. It says that they have information that I might be trading in cryptos and all this stuff. And I said, ignore that letter. There is no information about you trading in cryptos. All they're trying to do is trick you into responding. So this guy got tricked and he sued him. He put the money up and he sued him. And this guy just paid uh, whatever taxes like everybody else does that doesn't know any better. He paid all kinds of taxes on his thing. And he had already paid his taxes and he wasn't suing about the taxes. He was suing the IRS about the disclosure and obtaining the information from a third party. So it's interesting that cryptos are based upon um, this new platform, which is an immutable um, accounting ledger, you know, uh, that it's an open source accounting ledger that is public. Everybody can see it. And it's not like your name is on there with the entries, but you can you can discern that if you want to. But see, the IRS doesn't do that yet. The IRS can simply get some tech people from MIT or Google, and they can the IRS can go and get a special task force and and go to the visit the blockchain from the desktop in their office, and they can collect whatever information they want. They don't need to go to Coinbase. Realize that. So why the heck are they going to Coinbase? So they can grandstand. So they can scare people. Right? So they can scare you into thinking, oh, well, I guess I better tell the truth. Well, yeah, we should always tell the truth. But that doesn't mean anything. That doesn't create a tax liability. Seeing what I'm doing doesn't create a tax liability. I know it creates a tax liability. And I'm going to make it to where the way I use money and property doesn't create a tax liability in their eyes too. So but this guy didn't get that. So he thought this letter was custom made for him. And he thought the IRS had the information. And you know what's interesting is the IRS could have simply said in response to the federal lawsuit, it could have said, motion to dismiss, you didn't state a cause of action because we lied in the letter that you received, the 6172 or whatever he got here, 6153. Uh, we lied in there and we, we, when we said that we have information that you may be trading in cryptos and may have a tax liability. We just said that to prompt you to contact us. So therefore you can't sue us because we don't actually have the records that we claimed that we had or led you to believe in the letter. Of course, they're not gonna say that, but this is what's going on. They, they can't do that. They can't have that information. 10,000 letters, how do we get 10,000 letters? I don't know. Who knows it was 10,000 letters? I guess it was. Maybe the IRS said it was 10,000 letters. So anyways, he sues and he says, hey, it's not fair. Third party doctrine doesn't apply here. I, I still have rights to privacy. No, maybe you don't. Now, in my opinion, I don't think we have rights to privacy in that sense. I think we should. Um, we do have rights to privacy under the attorney-client privilege and other sort of privileges, I guess. They don't want us to exercise an actual right to privacy because a privacy right is a property right. Okay, it's defined by the Supreme Court as a property right. So they don't want us to have any private property rights. That is the purpose of having attorneys because they take those rights and people don't even understand what they are. So the way I would like to do things is I just assume that the IRS is going to 
grab all your data. And as you look at these cases, you, you read through this here. Okay, and there's some conditions on, they're trying to talk about conditions on which the IRS could obtain information, right? They have to show some evidence of wrongdoing and things like that. This is a show. It's, it's theater, okay? They're, they already have the information or they have access to it. It's so easy. They just want to know where to focus their resources. And I think they're trying to create some case law and they're trying to scare people. There's a lot of things like that going on here. Um, yeah, there are limits to a subpoena. I mean, really, it's not a subpoena. It's actually a summons. The, the summons is under the same rule as a subpoena, really, but the summons is under uh, the Federal Rules of Civil Procedure, uh, Rule 27, if you guys want to check that out. It's quite interesting. They never cite the rule because they don't want, they don't want anybody to know what that is. So then you would know the limitations. <clears throat> it's Rule 27. But anyways, this is all they're doing is trying to scare people. So they do have other remedies. The IRS can go to the blockchain silently. They probably already do. They probably have access to all kinds of databases. They could probably get people's crypto data from their phones most of the time without going through the legal process. But they don't want to do that or they don't want to make that the focus. They want this to be the focus. They want old school 1970s style audit from the IRS type thing to go on. And so Harper's playing into that. He doesn't know any better though. He doesn't know. So let's go over here. This one was, and this one was, you know, last year. So the lawsuit is trying to get privacy for crypto users. <clears throat> I'll just tell you that it's, it's gone. They're, they're not going to, the trend is to have no privacy. So here's what I do <clears throat> from the beginning, since the nineties, I always assume that my client has no privacy. And I try like hell to get privacy, the most I can possibly get for the client. And so sometimes I, I need to use public records to establish that there's no claim that can be made against my client for any civil liability. And so where I cannot get privacy or I can use public records to, to discourage investigations or litigation, that's what I'm going to do. Because the risk I'm trying to avoid is like cost of litigation and just dealing with the issue, right? <clears throat> so this is, let me give you guys an example. <clears throat> So let's say I, I signed a promissory note and I lent somebody $100,000. Let's say I lent a business $100,000. And so now I'm the lender and I'm going to get payments and the interest rate is like 6% or something like that. So the interest is taxable and it is taxable because let's say I'm a person that files a 1040. So because I'm the lender and I'm getting the interest rate, and by the way, you can't make a fake note. It has to be real numbers. You can't just say 0% interest. You don't want to anyways. All right, because they're going to audit you. All right, so so I'm getting interest and it's taxable and I can't get around that. And everybody can see it if they want to. The IRS can summon the records and whatever. So there's a third party and all this stuff. I'm not really going to get some sort of privacy on that because it, it's all discoverable. But if I add in as a lender, my brother or my friend or my partner, someone other than my spouse. So that way it's two disinterested people, two individuals with it, with different beneficial interest. If I make those two people, so myself and my brother or my sister, right? I make the each of us the lender on the note. And so now together we are getting the 6%. And together, let's just say we have a bank account and we're signing on the account. And neither of us would have the rights to withdraw the funds. That's our agreement. That's our arrangement. So that would mean that there's no tax liability forever as long as he and I or she and I are the note holders or lenders receiving the taxable that would otherwise be taxable interest payments. So when some day comes that one of us wants to take some money out, then we have possibly a tax liability and something to report. Forget 1099s and all that. I'm not talking about that. I'm just saying uh, by the IRS standards, if they individually receive a gain, I'm going to have a tax liability. I'm, the IRS wants a piece of it. Whether or not they see it, I'm just going to agree that it's subject to taxation. But until then, it's not. So let's say my brother and I make the, a bunch of money. Let's say we double our money in a year or whatever. So now we got $200,000. And together, we go buy another asset. Let's say we buy a, you know, a, a real estate investment. Or we buy a car or something. I don't know. If we're both the owner, the protection, let's call it, carries over to the ownership of that next thing. Because... He and I are not a taxpayer. We don't file a tax return. If we did, and we're not required to, by the way, just because we received money doesn't mean we have to file a tax return. This is different than people who filed a 1040 because 
you know, if, if you, unless you're out of that system, I mean, even I'm out of the system, but if I got a 1099, the IRS would say, hey, where have you been? You know, so I'm very careful not to get a 1099. So I don't create that obligation, if you will. I don't have to deal with that. But if my brother and I did things together and we use our SSN, uh, but we do everything in our names together collectively, there would not be a tax liability for the, the two of us because there never was. And if we filed a tax return together and claimed a liability, well, then the IRS would say, thank you very much, and then go from there. And then the IRS would then have a duty to reconcile that account every year. And from that moment, when we filed that tax return, it would probably be a partnership. Uh, whatever tax treatment that is, whatever the rate is, whatever, that's what would happen. And then the next year, if he and I are still doing things like that, we would have a subsequent liability until we told the IRS with um, something like we would have to D dissolve the partnership or we would have to tell them we did that or maybe we'd have to register with the state and dissolve it there's all kinds of ways of doing this so if i share my property rights with a group or a partner where the members of the group my brother and i don't have a joint liability to anybody and this goes for anything this goes for like if he's getting sued my brother's getting sued right for like 15 creditors and a bunch of money right they would not be able to reach into the organization of the both of us to take any money out because that's not his money and it's not my money. So people don't think about that, but what I'm doing is on public records, I'm changing the property rights so that they're in a way, they're held in a way that there's no liability. And then the person I'm working with can then use that property without the liabilities. You know, there's a few exception to that, but uh, this is not what people understand. No, no one's telling this. You know, there's only a few people that understand this basic concept. In fact, I, you know, I just think it's a lot of the people that I'm working with that are starting to understand this. So, yeah, so we're, so they're in the middle. It looks like they're still in the middle of preliminary hearings. They're still trying to challenge it. And so I'm just quote something here. It says the end result was the IRS sending 10,000 letters to crypto holders warning they may not have paid taxes properly. It's a total sales pitch. You got to see it for what it is. So. And I like this guy's attitude. They're 100% committed to the idea that I'm supposed to raise the issue by filing for a refund. So, you know, they, the IRS always wants to determine if you should get your money back. You don't get to use your money without us seeing and approving your use of money. <laughs> That's what this is about. I like this guy's point, but really, we have the power to change the title and title the property that we're using in the way we want. We pretty much do. Now, if you'll notice, if you guys are setting up LLCs and PMAs and things like that, uh, and you're, you're interacting with the banks, you notice that they don't like that. They're trying to push back on that because they know this defeats this whole scheme they're doing, but it's perfectly legal, okay? Yeah, so we have control over our data um, and property rights. Yeah, so, and again, I think they're creating case law. I made some notes here. So this guy, Harper, and he overpaid taxes, I think. But anyways, if I'm just going to open this up for questions. If you guys want to throw anything out, I, I uh, you know, if there's any point I missed here, just let me know. But let's let's do some brief Q&A if we could. Let's see if I can. I'm going to do a stop share here. I can go back to the screen, too, if you want me to. But hey, yeah, John. if you would. Yeah, yeah. So um, so I like I like what you're saying. Um, yeah, I just love it, you know. Uh, and um, I'm going to segue a little bit, but it's kind of the same thing. It's like basically using a trust to um, uh, diversify the ownership of whatever property it is you're dealing with, right? Yeah, the language I like to use is you're divesting, divesting. Sorry, di divesting. That's okay. Divesting. And I get this from case law, so I'm not the guy who thought of this stuff, but you're divesting your exclusive rights in property. So it's the right to and spend and the right to sell. Yeah, and you're creating undivided, um, like ownership. Yes. Yep. So I'm, I'm curious, you know, like Crypto J, he talks about um, using trust to do this very thing. I know you use LLCs. And, mm -hmm. um, and so he basically said, you know, trust don't have to report. But when I go in and I try to do the research on this and the actual code, I mean, it's such gobbledygook. I have a hard time understanding it, but I know that it's yeah. I, I know that it's in there um, because it's in there on a lot of other kinds of these code scams, like 
like, you know, driving basically under vehicle code means that you're engaged in commerce. So um, how do I like really get in there and find, you know, the okay. reality, the reality yeah, with, of. With the tax code, this is the hard thing. The ta it's not going to, it's not going to tell you what I'm telling you. It's like, it, it's excluded. They don't have to tell you this stuff. And that's why the code survived all the constitutional challenges because after the civil war, they tried to bring in the tax code and a central bank and they couldn't do it. They kept, they brought in a version of it and it kept getting stricken down by the Supreme court because it was imposing an obligation. Yeah. And there is no obligation. And so I just, the other day I had a conversation with somebody. I don't know why I let myself get sucked into this, but oh. I had a conversation on telegram with someone's attorney trying to, I don't know why I don't try to convince people. If you don't believe it, fine. But I just, you know, he was kept quoting the procedures and the, uh, what do you call it? The circulars of the IRS. And I said, show me what law Im Im imposes an obligation to file a tax return for anybody. Mm -hmm. And so when, when is the tax classification, when does that take place? And it's when you file a tax return. It's not when you get an EIN, which is what the attorney said. Is it when you get an EIN? No, it's not. The IRS doesn't care how you got the EIN. All they care about is, it is the tax return. Yeah, but is it created if you get, say, a 1099 or something like that, nope, which is an that's assumption? One. That, it's right. just an it's, assumption. It's just a report. It does not create an obligation to file a re tax return or, uh, or uh, pay a tax, actually. Just, just a, a record of a payment. That's all it is. It's yeah, so, that's what you file. So that's awesome. And so, um, you know, like my responsibility is like, do I even have to refute a 1099 for an entity, whether it's an LLC or a, no. a trust? No, I use them. I, I like getting them because it just, it's nice to have records. You know, if I want to do some accounting, I'll just send my 1099s for a trust or something, have some bookkeeper write up my balance sheet. That's kind of, I don't mm -hmm. have to collect all that data. You know, that's nice. I mean, I get those all the time from like Lulu and whatnot from publishing stuff. Um, but yeah, the 1099 doesn't create an, an obligation. Now, here's the, here's the exception. If you have yeah. filed a 1040 before and you get a 1099 with your SSN on there and you're the payee and you haven't filed a return, like me, for example, I haven't filed for like 30 years, okay? Uh, they would uh, say, send me, send me a letter and say, hey, where have you been? <laughs> we haven't received your tax return. I'm sure you guys have seen some of this before. Because I yeah. filed before and I could tell you from working so many cases, I've had, I don't 30,000 cases somewhere in there. I've had five people, five that I can remember for over the last, let's say, maybe 20 years. And for some, one reason or another, the people never filed a 1040. I had one guy tell me that he was like in his 30s and he said, my uncle said, to t he told me to never file a tax return. He said he was at, a, at my birthday party when I was 17. I don't know how that came up, but his uncle told him never to file a tax return. And he never did. And he had a corporate job. He was high up in the corporation. And the reason why he was calling me was because a lot of his colleagues were talking about investing and in tax benefits and all this stuff. And he was concerned that he should be doing what they're doing. And so what mm -hmm. I told him is, and I, and I have an interview, I go through a whole series because I make sure that I'm not giving him the wrong information. Sure. I told him how to confirm and verify that he did not file. If he did not file, so I told him, don't ever file. You can do whatever you want. You can do it in your name with an SSN. You never have to file a return. You'll be fine. You'll, you'll, it's not even illegal. Now, if you filed before, it's presumed to be illegal. I don't know why, but <clears throat> but it doesn't mean you have to file every year. I have clients that uh, get out of filing. <clears throat> they just stop filing. You can do that. Yeah. As long as, I, the easiest way is to filed. settle up with them. Yeah. 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 I haven't filed since 2012, but it hasn't stopped the uh, California uh, Franchise Tax Board from har harassing me and phishing with uh, scary yeah. looking notices that I owe a bunch of money, but I don't. And it's not, there's not even any liens on the record. It's well, just a let me spook. explain, let me explain about that. Do you have a W2 or anything like that? Um, no, actually my business didn't actually pay me any W2s. They just assessed fake fees and made it up. Well, okay. What about a 1099? Nothing like that. They never got any tax reports, W2s, 1099s, the franchise tax. Um, it was all done in a corporation. None of it was done yeah. under okay. uh, an SSN. So, so here's what they're doing. Here, and the same thing the IRS does. There's a, uh, <clears throat> there's a statute. It's called uh, the substitute for return. Yeah. What the heck statute was that under? You can look it up. Oh, yeah, no, I know. It. Yeah, okay. 6020B. All right. So if you don't file a return and you have before, the IRS will then take the last three years of the last time you filed and they'll extrapolate to, to estimate what you should have filed. Now, here's the thing. The IRS does not assess taxes. This is the thing. They, they never do. 
They never have. Yeah. This is what makes it sustainable. This is why they survive constitutional challenges because they tricked you into complying with something that's not required. But once you comply, you're considered to have been required to do whatever you just did. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, that's so uh, they do this. They make it. Th the only way their accounting system can work is if they create something that needs to be reconciled. And that's why I'd say to you, if you don't file a return for a trust or an LLC, there will be no need to reconcile anything. And even nice. if the IRS were to look at that, yeah, if you get the top IRS person, the, 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 a person who's actually competent, right? And he looks at what you did and he, and he sees, okay, I see $1.5 million coming into an LLC. And yeah. that came from an investment of a half a million dollars. And so what the IRS agent will say is, that is unsettled funds and I don't care. Now I'm, I'm speaking hypothetically, but I, I've just witnessed how they interact with the structures I create in the middle of a problem. I've never had, I've never created a structure to help someone do some planning and investing. I've never had problems later on. I've always gotten people out of the problem. In fact, right in front of the IRS. And this is how I know. <laughs> so, so, the, so, the, so the, the assessment comes when you file the tax return. Yeah, yeah. If you go and look at Joe Bannister's case, you'll see what, he was indicted in the 90s. This guy was an IRS, uh, what do you call it? I know uh, him. Criminal, I've, CID, I've, okay. Yeah, uh, he was yeah a, I know He him. was a gun-carrying CID agent. <clears throat> and one yeah. day he walked into his boss's office and he said, hey, answer me this. And they couldn't answer. He's like, I quit. <laughs> you guys are a bunch of liars. <laughs> yeah. So anyways, what they, what they found in the testimony is that uh, the IRS agent was testifying. And, so, and one of the attorneys asked, so at what moment is a tax return considered filed? He said... When we receive a tax return that appears to be valid, we affix a file number to it, and then we process it. And he said, it's not considered filed until we affix the file number. So how can you possibly file yep. a tax return if you can't affix the file number? Yeah, exactly. That just goes to show you. Yeah. I, I love it. And this doesn't matter. It's like like I have a, um, I have a trust that has a... a a foreign EIN because it was created in Canada. So it doesn't really matter. Like, nope, doesn't, doesn't matter. Doesn't, no. doesn't matter where the EIN has been created. And I think the EIN, um, you know, uh, if it's a foreign trust, um, I think that's determined by the treaty that the United States has yeah. with. And that's if you're involved in, in being a taxpayer. If you're always using unsettled funds, you're not going to have any problem that way. And define you, unsettled funds. Unsettled just means it never re the money hasn't reached its destination. And when does it reach its destination? When the person files a return to report the income. That's and it. that's the case. Yeah, and totally. And that, yeah. that makes sense with uh, a trust, no matter where the EIN is. Yeah, and I know you guys have probably heard this before, but I'll just tell you the story okay. just quickly. And, and I, I'm sorry I cannot cite the case. Maybe I shouldn't tell you if I can't cite the case, but this was in the- I'll look it up. Of, uh, I don't even remember. The, I have to go look. It's in one of my older, older books. Um, I'll, I'll look it up. But basically, maybe you can find this. Okay, so this was in the 80s. And it was an older couple that had retired. And they stopped filing. Why? Because their CPA said, you guys don't make enough money. You don't have to file. Which was, my parents did the same thing. They stopped filing too. And, and so that was standard stuff. <clears throat> well, the IRS agents didn't like that. So they sent a letter saying, hey, where are your tax returns? And they wrote a letter back and their CPA wrote a letter back and said, um, we're not required to file. We didn't make enough money. We just retired. We can only have social security. This is back when I think they did not tax social security. <clears throat> so uh, the IRS determined that they really wanted them to file a tax return. So they filed a substitute for return and that created a tax liability. That started the process, okay? And that take, takes a couple of years and uh, they ended up with a lien, a levy, lien levy. And so the IRS levied their bank accounts and took out $8,000. So, or they took out a portion of it. And so what happened was, here's, here's how you have to sue the IRS, if you don't know. You have to get permission to sue the IRS. And here's how you get permission. In that case, wow. they went to an attorney and the attorney said, okay, we have to file a claim for refund on form 843 and we have to file your tax returns. You just have to do it that way. And you have to pay the difference that they still say you owe. And then when they deny the 843 claim for refund, you then have the right to sue them in the US District Court, which they did. So during the proceeding, the DOJ advised the judge, they're supposed to do this. The DOJ advised the judge that <clears throat> the, the couple wasn't required to file tax returns in the first place. This was after probably days of a trial, okay? And so the judge says, hold on a second, well, what? You're, you went through all this mess and, and you're telling me now that 
they weren't required to file. I thought everybody was required to file. Why weren't they required to file? You never believe what she said. She said they weren't required to file wow. because they, they didn't file. Wow. Wow. <laughs> I mean, almost every time I try to verify that, I get verification of everything I'm looking at. And, and keep in mind, I've when I first started doing this in the 90s and the early 2000s, I would fly out to people's houses and I would stay there for a couple, couple of days, three days. And I would prepare yeah. all their documents. And a lot of these people were tax protesters in the traditional sense. And um, yeah. yeah, and so I would get them out of the audit situation by simply... Uh, creating records to give the IRS the same data they already had to make it look like I gave them whatever they wanted, but I didn't, mm -hmm. they didn't get anything new. And then they were mm -hmm. just left with a bill. And then I would, you know, walk my client back from that situation. So anyways, you know, that's that, I mean, that this whole thing is a scam, but I don't even like to, that's not even something to rely on. I mean, that just is nice to know that stuff. So look, let's assume that you have to file a return and let's just yeah. create a situation where you don't have a gain in their eyes by their own standards. And that's why, I can get the IRS to agree that my trades between cryptos and the increase in value is not taxable because of the way I say it in my letter. By the way, I just finished my series for the inner circle. So you'll see that come up pretty soon. We're going to publish that. I'm going to give you guys the letter. I'm going to show you how this works. So That's awesome. So you basically just volunteer the information that you want them to see and understand that shows there's a zero in obligation with whatever you do with the crypto, with the entity. Yes. So talking about the right to privacy, I can organize That's my beautiful. affairs. Yeah, you, you can organize your affairs in a way that creates a visible, everything on the, on the table way to the, get the IRS to determine that you have no tax liability. So, so there's no privacy when, when someone shows me a 1099B or something like that from Coinbase. And, and when I... When I write a letter to the IRS and I say, yeah, this is all, all the things that happen here, but this 1099 is erroneous because it doesn't represent the amount of dollars received from any disposition of the asset. And yeah. furthermore, my client wasn't the owner of the asset at any time. The owner was the exchange because of the re relationship that has to go there because of the technology, <laughs> because of the technology. So I just think that they're trying to scare people and the blockchain is the remedy. And I think in the near future, they will use the blockchain, but they're not ready to do it yet. I think they have to get rid of the old guard, so to speak, and bring in the techie, whatever system they're going to come up with. And they're probably working on that right now. But I think it's going to be those days when the dollar is not what it used to be, which is like a piece of paper somewhere. They're still going to call it the dollar, but I think it's going to be on the blockchain. Do you, um, do you still think that crypto has got a pump um, much higher for them to, to, yeah. to round everyone in still? Yes. They're, they're going to go in waves. Yes. I think it's going to, they're going to pump it up again. They're going to bring some people in. Also the big money is, is getting into cryptos now, right now they're organizing themselves. There was a big wealth transfer during this fake pandemic for like the last two years. There's a big wealth, wealth transfer, as you can imagine. Yeah. I, I, I read it. I read about all the small businesses going out and the bigs getting bigger. That's the small part of it. The big part of it on the background is the uh, mining operations and infrastructure and just just huge consolidation. Okay, of go is going on like Vanguard and BlackRock. These guys. Uh -huh. yeah, yeah. So that's this is this is kind of ominous. But anyways, yeah. So I think the I think the blockchain is the 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 tool of oppression in the future. But I also think that I mean, heck, we can write our own blockchain. And who the heck needs Coinbase? You can get around yeah. Coinbase. I mean, we have the technology. We just don't have the time to get together with two or three people and maybe download some tech from some apps from github okay and create our own blockchain we, we can do all that stuff we can create our own exchange so i think people are going to start realizing that just like the dark web i mean the dark web was invented by the u.s military and they've been the u.s government's been using the dark web forever we don't because yeah. why it's been demonized so but anyways i just i don't want to cover that is there any anybody else have questions on this i mean thank maybe you maybe i missed something here great. sure sure I think I think there's some hands up, John. Yeah, Heather Heather's got something. I get I got one too. All right. Oh, okay. So you're saying that if it's on the exchange, the exchange owns it. What happens yeah. then if you take it out and put it into your ledger wallet? Then you're in possession and you're the custodian of the private key. Once you have exclusive rights over the private key, then you're the owner. So you, you do become the owner once you put it in your own private wallet. Yes. Okay. Yeah, just like it's like just like the gold in your sock drawer or something or in your vault, the gold coin. It works just like that legally. 
Mm. All right. And anything else? Um, no, I'm not sure I really understand that, but I don't want to take up other people's time. Right, we can cover that more. Um, uh, their swagons. Hey, John. Um, I've got a LLC for where, well, you, you, you helped me set up an LLC in New Mexico. I'm from Canada. Okay. And I was just wondering, uh, I, I'm happy with my understanding of the concepts, but I was just wondering if you could throw out like a couple names of banks in the US for me to look into mm -hmm. that would allow me to yeah. send money around the world without needing to be at the location. Okay, uh, there's some friendly banks that we've been using actually since like 2009. Uh, Chase Bank is a good one. Chase Bank, you can open online. And yes, you can be a foreign signer for a domestic LLC. I think they want you to fill out a W-8 or something like that. That's fine. Okay. Um, there's that. And then uh, First Internet Bank, as I heard the other day. Let me, let me check real quick because I might have a list here. I try to compile a list because my clients write back and they say, hey, I had a great experience with such and such. And I'm, what I'm finding is some of these banks are like the new, I, I think it's the old banks doing some marketing and they're just positioning themselves to capture the market of people that are in tech, cryptos and things like that. So, some banks are turning you away, but then there's some out there that are wanting you if you're in the tech area. Let me see if I can find, I have my uh, read me first file here. So I can find something. But yeah, first internet bank and and also you can US US Bank is one, Chase Bank in the States, uh, first internet bank. Um, here's one called Fundera. F-U-N-D-E-R-A.com and they have business checking. So free business checking actually. Okay. And in the event that any of these banks want an address, uh, should I uh, should I give them the address that the LLC is registered under or can I just give them mine like in yeah, Canada? You can give them whatever address you want. And it just doesn't matter. Them, okay. Yeah, it doesn't matter and, and tell them don't send me mail. Sometimes yeah. they... Um, and they understand that sometimes they want you to verify that you actually have some sort of control over the address we use. And then my response to that is, well, I don't, I just, I just got that. I just got this company set up. It's brand new, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know? So you just kind of have to talk your way through that. I mean, sometimes we can do a lease agreement or something, but it's, it's unnecessary. Okay, great. Um, yeah. um, thank you. That's, that's okay. the only question I had. Thank you very much. All right. All right. All right, Jim, what do you got? Uh, hey, John, uh, you created my LLC for me last summer in Pennsylvania. Okay. And I have a couple of questions on a few things I want to do. And it might take up 15 minutes of your time. Is there a good time I could call you next week? Yeah, that'd be fine. Um, th my calendar is on aceofcoins.com. Uh, usually, uh -huh. if you can't get on the calendar, if you try to get me before 3 p.m. Eastern time, okay. Um, a text message you guys you have my phone right my phone number. yes uh, yes Just send me a yeah send me a text message and, and you're okay to send me two or three because sometimes they get pushed down and i don't see them okay so yeah please do that and if you're not on the calendar i could probably get you just about before i start my three o'clock calls okay yeah thank okay. you because i, I yeah. tried to send you a proton mail and it said to go to the chat in the ace of okay. coins and i went okay. there and i hadn't heard back so i wanted to sorry about that reach yeah out for this. yeah try to call me directly okay thank you john sure um, there's a question here, uh, not paid taxes, need to avoid getting a 1099. Hey, you and me both. Um, I don't file returns. I've not broken any laws, but if I get a 1099 with my name and SSN on it, the IRS will want to talk to me. And they'll probably tell me I have to file returns for forever. <laughs> and I don't know how they're going to come up with any data there because there is no data. Uh, there's nothing even to estimate from. Um, okay, so when you, when you register a company in the state of New Mexico, someone's asking about how to get the article. So when we register it, sometimes my assistant, maybe she forgets to send you the actual uh, stamped articles. Um, you can go search on the company name with the Secretary of State, and usually they'll just, it'll just pop up and you just download it. Sometimes the states aren't that friendly. So we usually send it with, with our final documents. So if we didn't, just say, hey, where's the uh, stamped articles? And the nice thing is the banks just want a copy of the stamped articles. Uh, years ago, they would ask for a certified copy, which is a pain to get those. So yeah, the, but the state has yours. It's interesting because if the state has yours, why doesn't the employee at the bank just go look it up? It's public record, but they kind of make us go through those hoops. Yeah. 
And how far will Iris go to track your holdings through the ledger to determine that I am in your private wallet? I haven't seen that yet. I have not seen them. Okay. It would be the same effort that you may have maybe heard about if you ever heard a case on the IRS wanting to look at someone's gold coin holdings. Like if you're a, a gold investor and you there's a record of in your bank statement that you sent money to this coin broker and then you received it, they sent you the gold and then who knows where it is now, but at an audit, that is where that would come up. And then so what? So you bought something. So let's just say, I always assume the worst case scenario, they can see that. And if you bought, if you bought something and now you have holdings, that doesn't create a tax liability. So it's funny too, because I mean, I always say that it's funny too, but it's, it's peculiar that <clears throat> let's say you got a gold coin and let's say you owe, owe the IRS some money and they want to talk to you and they are sitting at the, across the table from you. And the week before you sold your gold coin at a really nice profit. You haven't accounted for it yet. You will, you'll pay tax on it later. But for right now, all that it shows is you sold your gold and you have this nice lump sum of cash in your bank account. Well, it was there last week. You did something with it. Who knows? And I've, I've been to audits before where the IRS says, what'd you do with that money? And so what I tell my client is just confirm that the IRS is correct and then stop talking. <laughs> like, what are they going to do about that? For all they know, you're, you're so uh, caring about your family that you owed your grandmother that money because of a loan she gave you and you paid her first, right? Who cares? I was able to use cabbage, okay, for John's LLC and had no, that's nice to hear. So cabbage is probably what, an exchange or is it a bank? That's a funny name for a bank. So yeah, sometimes like some people tell me, like this one guy told me he just opened his Bank of America, no problems. Some people call me and say, I can't get Bank of America to open my account. I don't know. I think it has to do with their employees. Um, on the PMA, we don't register it. That's the whole point of a PMA. Okay, the only reason we register an LLC, which we don't even need to do that. I mean, if you're gonna use an LLC to run a business, you have to announce it to the public. The, the states monopolized this method, this process for like the last 50 years since World War II. So the bank will not open your account unless you register it with the state. So what account holder do I have? Oh, it's an LLC. I do not need a PMA to be an account holder. Maybe the PMA owns the account holder. Maybe it's the single member manager of my LLC. And certainly it does not need a tax number. It does not need to do anything. It just needs to own my LLC. That's all it does. It owns 100% of the interest. Uh, it does not file a tax return, register, or anything like that. And let me give an example of what a PMA is. A private membership association. It's defined by the membership and what it excludes, not what it includes. This is our standard case law, okay? PMA has a lot of power. The, the court system, like your local court, has the same legal standing of being a private membership association as your family. Your family is a private membership association. And that last birthday party you went to, that was a private membership association. Same with that wedding party. So is your school, unless it's a public school. Have you ever had any success reversing an IRS lock-in on a W-2? A lock-in, no. Um, I'm assuming the lock-in is when you claim like nine deduction, nine nine, uh, what is it called, dependents or something like that, max dependents. And then after a couple of years, the IRS said, hey, you can't do that. You only get one. I, ca I can't reverse that. <clears throat> uh, what do I do in that situation? I mean, I don't know. I, 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 can't, I can't do anything with that. You, the problem is, I hate to say, that you have wages. That's, I, I, you can't get out of that. Once you have wages, you're kind of stuck in that whole system. Uh, when creating the LLC, do you submit the operating agreement, the articles? Yeah. What I do is... <clears throat> When you, here's how you create an LLC. How, here's how you register it. You just go to the Secretary of State and you fill out their intake form on the internet. That's how we do it today. I mean, it used to be on paper, but all you're really doing is just declaring in the public, because the state will publish this, the name, the owner, the address, if it's perpetual or not, and the relationship <clears throat> and indemnification of the owners, okay? Basically is what you're doing. <clears throat> What you're paying for is the filing fee. So if you register an LLC in the state of New Mexico, you're gonna pay $50. And so here's what you're paying for. You're paying a tax for indemnification. This is the whole beauty of the whole thing because this is how our railroad system got built. If it wasn't for this type of situation, we wouldn't have been able to build up our railroad system so easily. Um, and not that it was that easy, but the state is indemnifying you. The state is saying, hey, everybody, 
anybody who wants to make a claim against this newly registered company can't do it as long as the people in that company are following the rules, meaning you're not going to use the company for any illegal purpose. We got their back. We're going to give you charging order protection. We're going to give you whatever indemnification goes along with this type of structure. And that's what creates things. That's what creates investments and things like that. So that's your that's what your fifty dollars is for indemnification. <clears throat> Yeah, we don't we don't give them the operating agreement because that can change every day. But the articles announced to the public are what make it binding on the world. Binding meaning that everybody has to take it at face value. That's why I explain, just get your account open if the bank's giving you a hard time about how you structured the ownership in the company. Tell them whatever you want because the articles are what count, not what you submitted on your EIN application, not what you told the bank. None, none of that matters. Um, I just sent all my info for Internet Bank. Okay. They're, they're all online. Okay, interesting. I uh, just got a call. That's nice to know. Okay, so you just you, you use First Internet Bank. Okay, that's nice to hear that. I wouldn't recommend opening an account with the PMA. I, I would not recommend making the PMA the account holder. I would recommend using your LLC as the account holder because I think the LLC is better suited to deal with the world because you've got all kinds of legal protections with an LLC. You have a huge amount of legal protections with a PMA. We can get into that. There's a whole school on that. But uh, I would not open a PMA account it's kind of exposing it to everything. He's, I mean, I don't know if you guys ever read Title 12 of the uh, Code of Federal Regulations, the banking regs. It takes up this whole back wall here, by the way. So who wants that? <laughs> you know, I would not put my PMA in that. Um, all right, so if you buy a truck with a business loan from an LLC you created, do you list the PMA as the owner of your actual name? You, you could buy the truck however you want. I, you know, get, the PMA should be in the background. My daughter just bought a car the other day. She bought it with financing too. And she, um, <clears throat> it was actually easier to get financing and buy the car the way she did uh, using her LLC. So always, always use an LLC. I like Jay's trust for this, by the way. I like his trust organizations as a quick, uh, quick solution to owning title to a car. And the PMA is the best thing to do. Why? Okay, well, <clears throat> the best, I think, the best method is to have a, an LLC that expresses what I described earlier, where it's my brother and myself that are the joint owners of property. That is not enough today because of the way the bank software works. So that's why we use the LLC, because now we have a statutory framework and we're going to get certain benefits and indemnification. Whereas if we just did it individually, they might be able to pierce that. But if I use an LLC, perfect. If I use a PMA, what could happen is the protections my LLC would give me would go away, but the PMA has certain protections. But what could happen is somebody could challenge the relationship of the property rights with a PMA. But with an LLC, it's taken at face value and the courts will uphold it without a question, unless you're drug dealing or something like that. That is why, yeah, good, okay. You did open as LLC. That's why, why I use an LLC. Uh, and I see you got lots of hands up. I'm gonna get to those in a second. Are the banks running a personal credit check? Yes, they always do. Here's what the banks do. First of all, they check with your, your number that you're using for your credit, with most people it's SSN, they check what's called the death index to make sure that you're not using someone else's SSN and make sure that that SSN is not currently assigned to someone who's recently deceased. That sounds weird, but no one ever talks about that. The next thing the banks do is they, they run a check on a credit reporting service, much like Equifax called Check Systems, C-H-E-X Systems. Check Systems is regulated under the Fair Credit Reporting Act and that keeps data regarding like, let's say if you owe five bucks to your other bank for a fee or something, you never paid it, the new bank won't open your account until you pay the other bank. It's like their buddy system. But yeah, that's pretty much all they do. They check to make sure you have a credit file. They make sure that number is not assigned to a dead person. And then they check your check system to see if you owe to other banks. And then maybe it depends on, maybe it's a credit union. Maybe they'll check, check your credit score because sometimes the banks use your account to, I think they all do this. I think they all rec regard your account as a loan to you, even though you're bringing the money. If you bring a thousand dollar deposit or a hundred thousand dollars, the banks account for that as if they lent you that money. So that's why they want you to have good credit because when they go to their, you know, third parties or whatever, I guess you call them relenders or something, uh, they want to be able to rate that paper. So that's what's going on. Yeah, personal credit, opening account. Yeah, they are. Um, okay, so how do you get around that? Okay, so maybe that you're not going to get around as the signer. So what you want to do is have your LLC be the account holder. And yeah, they're still going to run a check maybe, but it's not so prominent because your LLC is the account holder. If you want more attention 
and more assessment based upon the LLC. If you really want to do this, which I've not seen a need to do this unless you're actually going to need business credit, you can set up a Dun & Bradstreet file. It takes like a few months. Uh, it doesn't cost much to do this. It just takes time and some paperwork, basically. But you can set up a, <clears throat> a Dun & Bradstreet credit file, and that just involves some net 30 accounts. All right. So let me check here. All right, let's see. We got uh, Heather's iPad. Is it alive? Heather's iPad. <laughs> yes. <laughs> All right. Oops. Okay. So um, my questions are real beginner. So I don't want to like um, consolidate any time and take away from the rest That's of the right. thing. But um, so um, we were watching. This is my roommate, and uh, Greg is retired. He receives. Um, Social Security benefits. So, sorry, I'm trying to include him in here. Um, okay. So, um, you know, he wants to keep those and everything. So, we would need to um, keep him hidden, you know, right? And, and everything that we're doing, um, as far as um, like, here's something. First of all, we watched the real estate video the other day, and I reached out to Mr. Tycoon because oh, we're okay. really interested in doing that. Mm -hmm. Also, I'm following along with what you're saying by and large, but I'm missing like little hunks and pieces and I'll come back to that because I wanted to ask you if you thought we should watch all the videos and then reach out for a consultation or. It doesn't matter. Okay. No, whatever, whatever you feel like doing. Because we've watched a lot of videos. <laughs> okay. We've, all right. we've, we put in some, <laughs> we put in some effort. All right. <laughs> Great. That makes it easier yeah. when we have a conversation. So, a lot of your videos. Well, okay. well, right. and just even the one with Mr. Tycoon, I had to rewind it and watch a couple parts of it over and over and over again, mm. like the subject two and the warranty deeds and all that stuff. Mm -hmm. And so I'm, and uh, anyways, aside from the point. So, um, so as far as like any investments that um or any gains or whatever, we need to hide all of that. Uh, we want to make sure that he stays. Um, free and clear. yeah, free and clear. So from what now, what kind of money we're talking about? Like, where's it coming from? He, uh, he receives social security benefits and well, that, I, I cashed in a 401k that I'm holding back without being mm -hmm. in the bank. Yeah. And is that, you already paid the tax on that to, to cash it out yeah. or whatever you're, you're done with the IRS. Yeah. So yeah. We call that after tax money. So you're free and clear there, do what you want. If you manage everything under a uh, shared interest, like an LLC, the way I'm suggesting, it doesn't matter who sees what. You can do whatever you want. Oh, you don't have to okay. hide. Yeah, you don't really have to hide anything. Oh, All you're good. doing is changing your property rights. Yeah, they can see it. I mean, they're they definitely can see your SS money. <laughs> so <laughs> take take okay. your cash and buy something that you're comfortable with. You know, if you don't want to, I mean, uh, some people I just say go buy some gold and keep some cash and have fun with it. You know, some people want. I've to done some of that. Well, he's okay. got that, but we're ready to like um, try to. Um, make some money yeah okay well what there's some you? videos on that and we can have that conversation too if you want to set a time with me you're welcome to do that okay so, yeah if remember i was saying last time if you're if you're members okay of anything if you called me or and paid for consultation or something you're welcome to schedule with me and just not pay for that call so you just use the coupon code just so you know okay cool. What's the, yeah. coupon? What the, is coupon the coupon code is free c-o-n two zero two two I just asked that it's only for people that have already paid something, anything. Oh, well, sure. The video. Not, yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't want to take advantage of, you know, it's I don't okay. want you to think that we're trying to take advantage. So no, it's okay. I if I have time, I'll be glad of Guidance and all that stuff. So yeah, sure. I just wanted to make sure we're doing it the right way. And because we need some help. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely. It always helps one-on-one. -on -one. It's just hard to get me, but certainly I look forward to talking with you. Okay, cool. Thank you. Thank you. All right. All right. So we'll go to Demetra. Hi, John. How are you? Hey, Thank you. All right. um, so I've got a couple of uh, like one, two, three, bam, and quick stuff I want to get. First of all, uh, are only the U.S. exchanges generating 1099s? Do you know? Anything in the States would do a 1099. Some like are still a not. Like or a bit true out of the country. We don't have to worry about that. Uh, they will do a 1099 where there's it's considered a U.S. account holder. That's all. So I do have, we do have to check if we've traded in those accounts as well to yeah, see if they your, generated. Yeah, they should. I think they're required by law to send you by email. And a lot of these uh, companies have software that uh, uh, has an inbox, I think, like an email inbox when you sign onto your account. If yeah. they sent you a 1099, it will be an email. 
So okay. Check for that. Yeah. So then once you download all of your 1099s from the various exchanges and you find that they're pretty accurate, then do you just go ahead and submit them to, to you know, April 15th? Yeah, uh, yeah if, if they're accurate. I mean, if, if that dollar amount that's stated on there, if you actually yeah. got that in your hand, then that's what if they're, they're not? What if there's a discrepancy? Then do, what do you do? Because they've already reported to the IRS. Is it in a personal account or LLC or for, right now personal for, for my okay. question? Yeah, my if line of personal question. and you got a 1099 and the dollar amount does not match what you actually received, then mm -hmm. you have to get it corrected. And this is why I'm, I did that video, that series to, yeah. to teach everyone how to ask the IRS to agree that it should be excluded from your 1040. Okay. What if I so never far. took any any USD? Everything that is just right. basically. That's why yeah. we can ask them to agree with us. If you took the dollars, then to that extent we can't get them to agree. So, like, if you actually took some dollars out, we have to back that out of the request we send into the IRS. Gotcha. Okay. So there is further once I check everything. Okay. So um, number two. I wanted to know. Remember, if you remember, a couple of weeks ago we talked, and I mm -hmm. took my primary residence, my condominium, took it out of trust, a bank trust that I had it. I turned it into an LLC. I turned the ownership over to the LLC. I went and recorded it with the county clerk's office. Mm -hmm. um, so now, because I put it in the LLC that we originally opened for crypto investment and real estate, mm -hmm. perfect. Now, do I need another one for cryptos? No, cryptos are, are quite liquid. So that's why mm -hmm. the risk is low. You can always move those around. You can put those right into a private ledger. Now, if it's real estate, that's a bit different. So your house mixed with a real estate investment is probably a no-no for okay. at least the short, well, not the short term, but the long term. Like if it's over a year, maybe not. If you have a lot of things going on, like people trying to collect money and things like that, I wouldn't lump them together. What you could do though is if you want to use your LLC for multiple purposes, like for, here's an example. So if I have a, a house and a car, if I, it's my house I live in and it's my car that I drive and maybe I want to protect the title. And by the way, vehicles, low risk, houses you live in, higher risk. So one or the other, you can take your LLC that has maybe a crypto account and you can make it the owner of your house. And if you want to use that same LLC to protect your car, you would just file a lien on the car with the LLC as the lien holder. If you want to do it the other way around, you can put a lien on your house and have the LLC own the car while it still has a crypto account. That would be okay. But for right now, the only thing in the LLC that I've opened is because I haven't cashed in any cryptos or anything. I'm still sitting on those. Those are in cold storage. Mm -hmm. But is it okay that my condominium is now in the LLC? It's owned by the LLC. That's fine. Is that where you live? Yes. Yeah, that's fine. That's okay. Yep. Okay. With, with that, I remember you saying, I had taken notes from a while back that you said it is best. Let me quote you. <laughs> it's ideal to have a second member owner named in your mm -hmm. LLC. So when is it beneficial? Because this is a PMA and I've now finally understood, got wrapped my brain around what you mean. I don't have to disclose who's in the PMA because people come and go in my PMA. That's right. The PMA yes. is its own entity. And as long as you don't apply any percentage of ownership to any one of the PMA associates, right? They can't tax you, correct? Or take money out, right? There, there, is, there never will be a tax on the PMA. It's only going to be when it disperses funds to some person that where it reaches its final destination. Uh, one one solo individual of the PMA of the, right? It doesn't matter who is, if he's part of the PMA or not, if the funds leave the PMA and go somewhere to a taxpayer, someone who files a tax return, that is going to have to be accounted for. That's the, So in that's other words, you're simple. always buying and selling at, with the LLC as the owner, buyer, seller. Okay. Yes. So you're using only that bank account? Right. Well, I can I can do an, I can have several accounts for one LLC. I can also take that money from that LLC and set up a whole new LLC, uh -huh. different bank account. I can move money from company to company. OK, so with the, with my condo being owned by an LLC whose ownership belongs to the PMA, what's the challenge there? What's where can they come That's after me? Not not. That's a nice, clean way to do it. Either a, a dual membership or a PMA owner. That's perfect. So are those comparable, a, a dual membership yeah. like you said, uh, okay, versus so a PMA? Here's the difference. My LLC either way is going to be an innocent party, meaning that 
it's away from my, it's out of my estate. There's no one that would have a claim against me and be able to take property from my LLC. That's what I mean by innocent party. So the owner of it either gives me charging order protection, meaning that the court will protect it, or it doesn't give me that. So if it doesn't give me that, and I, I'm using a probably a PMA as a single member owner, that PMA is an innocent party because it only does one thing. It owns the LLC. No one's ever going to sue that LLC. But if you owned it, it no one's ever going to sue the PMA. If you owned it individually, there's a lot of people that could probably sue you. You probably do lots of things in this world. You know, you probably have all kinds of contracts you never even thought about before. But the PMA does nothing except own the company. Okay, so, so when, when we're labeling it as a single member, uh, single member LLC, the single member is a co member is a collective mm -hmm. group of people that are just not being identified. Sure, or or they are. It doesn't matter. But right. the single member owner in name creates a single member LLC with no charging or protection. But that doesn't matter because you don't need it because it's an innocent party. It's completely outside of anybody's legal right to sue because it does nothing. Okay. Okay, gotcha. And then I think those are the immediate questions. So then um, we talked about te uh, on the last call, uh, it was brought up about the only way to avoid filing taxes are to get your name, it, to get, uh, if you're not on a W-2, for the 1099s to be um, attributed to an LLC, correct? That That's helps, yes. Make it payable okay, that to a pass-through entity, yes. Okay, so if I'm working as an independent contractor, and right now they have my social security number because that's the only thing I have, um, I would open up an LLC. Would you be able to do the a next call or two showing us like how, um, what kind of LLC could you get to transition out of your personal social security number into um, an what is it EIN I believe right from from an LLC so that you're, oh. you're then. Yeah. Uh, I think I discussed that last time. Um, one second here. About how to get out of, I think I did a call on that. Right, but we, we kind of touched on it. What I was wondering is if you could do a whole sort of themed um, video on the do's and don'ts of using an LLC when you're using it as a, you know, for work purposes, right? Like what kind, what types of um, events or transactions would create taxable events, what you should be doing or shouldn't be doing, or do you already have videos on that? Yeah, I think I do. You do? Yeah. Okay. I remember, I think a few weeks ago, I did one on how to get out of, uh, if you're, if you have an S corp or some other source of income that's, you know, have a certain tax treatment, and you want to get out of that. I explained how to get out of that. I use a W9, dissolve the company, you know, Make it oh, a pass through. Okay, I was okay. referring to last week. Okay, I'll search those out. But I yeah. do definitely need a new LLC if I'm going to transition as an independent contractor from me, the person, to an LLC, correct? Yeah, correct. Yeah, anytime you're getting the 1099, you can easily switch that over to an LLC. It just takes maybe a phone call sometimes or you go on log into somebody's account, you know, your pay payroll account or something, or send them a, a W-9 with a letter. It's but I have to have uh, another LLC I have to open because I've only got the one for mm -hmm. crypto. If you have to, yeah, that's how, that's how you do it. Yep. Okay. New and LLC, then what EIM. Okay. And then what happens to the money you've earned prior to opening up the LLC so you can transition with that? Uh, yeah. If, if you earn that in your name, you're yes. stuck with whatever liability that associates that to that. So you can't go no back and change it. <laughs> well, that is grandfathering. I mean, really, I mean, it works both ways because if, if the IRS, if you can't get reverse your tax liability that way, they can't then reverse a tax liability the way they want. <laughs> they couldn't go back two years from two years you know, ago and say, oh, it should be this way. So yeah, uh, when, it, when the moment you change everything, your tax treatment, then it's going forward. Going forward. Okay, gotcha. All right. Yeah. And uh, where would those videos be on transitioning from, you know, from a person to an LLC with the 1099s? I think it was in February. I have to go look. Uh, I may have uploaded it already. So it might be in the members area, but I'll go check. And see okay. If I can send you the link. I'll look for it. Yes. And then yeah. do I have to schedule, um, schedule another council to open up a second LLC? Uh, you can, or can, you can do the order form and just put a note on there that this is a second one. And by the way, guys, I don't charge more money for another one. I just collect the filing fee for you. So it's part of the same okay. deal, unless you have some big project going on. So on yeah. Ace of Coins, right, John? Yeah, right, exactly. Yeah, you okay. can just do that, right. 
Okay, thank you. All right. right, sure thing. All right, and then someone's asking, uh, you said one time, yeah. Okay, so if you wanna buy real estate uh, and you have cryptos and you wanna turn those into dollars or put them in escrow in some way, maybe the down payment or something, or just pay cash for a house, you can do that. I have a service that does that. It's with my partner. He set up ex an exchange to do this. It's a private exchange. You'll never even see it anywhere. But um, if question. you have an LLC where you're able to sell your coins into the name of an LLC, that's a cheaper way to go because there's a there's a commission that goes on that transaction. So I would just recommend using your LLC to do that unless you have some sort of limitation there. All right, and then what would I describe the money I use from LLC bank to my 10 in my 1040 MICS description line miscellaneous? It's other income. If you take money out of your LLC that's th from a pass through and you, you want to have to report it on your 1040, like let's say you pay your credit card bill or something, it's other income. You don't need a 1099 for that. Uh, is the same in setting up a bank account in the name of the trust? Yes, yeah, it's, it's the same. You just have, it's just a different way to do it. The trust is compatible with the way we use an LLC. I need to set up a trust account so that I can deposit money that would otherwise be subject to garnishment. Exactly. Uh, the trust is a third party. It's an innocent party. And yes, that would avoid a bank garnishment, but it will not avoid a wage garnishment at the source. So if your employer is paying the money out, if the creditor tries to take it only from your bank account, you're covered. If he tries to take it from the employer, you're not covered unless you're in North Carolina, South Carolina, Texas, or Pennsylvania, <laughs> all right? Or unless there's some exemption, like Florida has exemptions. So there's other things too. I mean, if you have a wage garnishment, it's important to you. We can actually create a lien that blocks wage garnishments. That's a different subject. All right, so <laughs> I can raise your hand. And I don't know where the icon is to raise your hand. I think you waited so long that maybe you already figured that out. <laughs> That, all right. Uh, so if the if the crypto exchanges are reverting you to their software, and no ten items furnished, there's no record. Are we assuming they know nothing of it? Okay. So if you don't see a 1099 from the exchange, none was issued. You you have to get one. They're not going to make a mistake. I did, it's all automated. Now, if you're not sure, and again, this is what I did cover the other day. If you're not sure, if you, there's a 1099 posted to your, here's some technical language. Everybody has IRS records who's ever filed a 1040. You're gonna have something called an individual master file. This is your accounting ledger that needs to be reconciled. This is where when you file a tax return, it creates the need to reconcile, okay? So there's an individual master file and a business master file. And you would use form, IRS form 4506-T. You can Google this on the internet. And look at the top right corner, make sure there's an OMB number on there. I don't know what the number is, it's 1545 or something. So that's the official government form. And in the middle of that, you put your name and information, your SSN, all that stuff. And then you check the boxes as to which transcripts you want. And you'll see in there, it'll make sense. It's self-explanatory. You'll want your 1099s and everything. This is another way to check and see what the IRS knows about you if you're not sure if something was reported. But yeah, the exchanges are supposed to tell you, they're supposed to give you a copy of the 1099. All right, and okay, what I find the inner circle. Okay, so the inner circle is about to appear. I was talking to uh, my partner today and it should, it should be showing up quickly. Well, let's say this month, okay? We're gonna, probably gonna do a live Q&A on that. It's gonna be, it's gonna be really cool. Right, the exchanges are trying to get people to volunteer and contract with the IRS when it was not required. Right. If you didn't exchange crypto back to FRN, oh, they oh, maybe. mark up a tree, yeah. Yeah, that's interesting. I mean, I don't know if they're trying to create a contract, but they're, they're trying to induce you to do what they want you to do. So if, once you know what your rights are and know the law and how you're, you know, how, what creates the liability, you, you, it's pretty easy. It's just very easy. That's why I'm not intimidated by all this stuff. I mean, it's just the sales pitch. What was coupon code? Okay, so I will give you the, I'll give you the coupon code. So if you've already you know, paid for service, joined the membership or anything like that, consultation or ordered a company, um, the coupon code to schedule a call with me is gonna be free CON2022. All right. All right. Have to have the name. Yeah, you don't have to have your LLC in the same state. I know a lot of attorneys try to get you to do that. You can have the LLC where it makes sense for you to do that. I mean, I I base it on a state that doesn't doesn't send me lots of notices. I would stay away from California, uh, New York. New York kind of like is like an anchor. You know, it just kind of sticks you sometimes because of the, the crypto world. But yeah, choose a state that makes sense. I mean, I'm in Florida. Florida is actually a pretty friendly state, in my opinion, to set up a company. I, I've set up many over here. My daughter has one over here. So yeah, try to get your waiver. That's right. The rule is different for a brokerage account. 
You know, it's not. The rules, I mean, no, the rules are not, I mean, brokers accounts maybe have SEC type rules, but bank accounts have FinCEN rules, Financial Crimes Network. They're about, they're very similar. Um, you have the same KYC. That's like an overlay on top of everything. So if you can do something at a bank account, you can pretty much do it at the exchange, or trade account, like for stock trading. Uh, yeah, so I'll check and see, I'll follow up, so. All right, yeah, um, I, I, I am, I'm gonna be, um, you know, hiking the Appalachian Trail, but I, believe it or not, I will be available. I will have my phone with me, that's crazy. But that just means that sometimes it's not as easy to get me, if it's easy, if it's easy at all, if I should say that. All right, so here is um, KY Proust, did I say that right? Hey, hey John, it's Kai. Hey, Kai. Um, Hi, hey, uh, uh, I've got a quick question for you. You we've spoken a couple of times since October, and uh, we decided our strategy was to create a holding company. I'm in Canada, in Ontario, so I was creating a holding company here. Uh, I go ahead and do that, and then you're going to send me the uh, the the changes to the incorporation so yes. that it right. Um, I made the corporation last week, and I immediately got a a um, email saying that I had to do an initial return. And I was immediately leery of that because I think that the goal is to not do any returns at all. Uh, I looked in the, into the um, act, the Ontario Corporations Act, and it says every corporation other than extra provincial corporation or a corporation of a class exempted by the regulations shall file with the minister an initial return. So I, I just wondering what I mean. Should we should I change strategies and use a different like because there's other ways we can incorporate, or should I right. just stay with? There it? are other ways to do this. Uh, this is new territory for me. I'm not sure, but uh, notice how what they're doing there. Once they once you file a return, you create a tax classification. This is right. the same thing in the states. So I would just suggest to you that you not file a return because here's an example. Let's say you set up the company. And then you convey your mom's house title that she lives in. She's the only one that lives there. And you, she conveys it to the company for estate planning purposes to take it out of her estate. And, and it's for your benefit, maybe you and your brother's benefit. And she doesn't file a tax return. Why? Because it doesn't do anything. It just holds the title of the real estate. There's no tax on there or anything. So I know that you can do that. And that's okay. the definition of a holding company. And I did the research on the holding companies in Canada, among other states, even I did some in, uh, in the UK and they, they do recognize holding companies and they do have some filing, like filing returns, okay? It's the same information you're gonna see here in the States. Now, I, I've never seen a, a law or statute in the States saying what you just said for Canadians. Right. So, and that's probably a law, I'm, I'm guessing. Here, what we have is um, website commentary <laughs> or circulars. Uh, so I would just not file and see what happens. And I would be curious if you, know, if you get something, a notice or something, if you would, please let me see that. Yeah, they, they give 60 days from from the from creating the uh, corporation, and all they say is uh, uh, comply with requirements and avoid compliant compliance action that may result in cancellation of the corporation. But again, this may it, it's they're not they don't say what kind of corporations are exempt other than that one example. So you know. Yeah, and I'll give you an example. So in Kentucky and Oregon, I've noticed uh, when we do a, an LLC there in those states, we'll get a letter. <laughs> from the, the tax people, the Department of Revenue for the state, because they, they work together, right? So they'll send a letter and say- We're we not bombing you, Rick, Ukrainians. We haven't right. received your uh, tax Ukrainians return. are bombing Ukrainians. All right, sorry about that. Right, you, can, you can unmute if you want to. Um, and, the, and the state of Kentucky and Oregon uh, says you, you didn't file a return. And so we think, you have employees and you're paying wages and we think it's this much money and they'll send you this letter. And so I have a standard response. You'll see in my review first file, okay? If you go look through there, you'll see. We just write back and say, no, we don't have any employees. Uh, this company doesn't have any employees and what records are you relying upon? <laughs> and that's, that's the end of it, you know, most of the time. All right. So yeah, so let's see, I'm, that's what I'm thinking. I'm thinking you're gonna get a letter like that and I'd just be very interested because what they'll do is they'll cite some law and I'll go look it up, no big deal. All right. All right. All right. Yeah, I'll look for the articles and see what we need to do there. So, all right. Yep. Appreciate that. All Thanks. Right. Okay. And for the PMA, if the banks want to give you a hard time, you know, here's what I like to say to the banks. Okay. What is your problem with the PMA? What, what is that? It's not even your account holder. My, your account holder is the LLC. What are you talking about a non account holder for? What rules apply to non account holders? 
if you need to, just put a, a note on there saying that I'm the trustee for the PMA and I'm the only member, right? And that usually gets you right, right in there. They'll, they'll be fine. Okay. Just try, you know, that's an easy way to get around with their, they want to investigate it. Right, actually, a, a, a real quick question. Sorry to uh, interrupt. Uh, I haven't, we haven't changed. Uh, so right now I'm the, the, the sole owner of this uh, corporation. We haven't changed any of the ownership yet. Should I go out and get all my bank accounts and all that kind of stuff now? Because it'll just solve, it'll make it easier. Yeah. And then, and then we'll yeah. change the, okay, great. I'll do that. Sure can. That's a whole idea. Yep. All right. Good thank question. you. All right. And TD. Hey, John Jay, thanks for taking my question. So right. I have to file a 1040 under my SSN. The crypto question there is, did I have any crypto transactions? Mm, right. Now I did, I did have money going from my bank accounts to Coinbase, Gemini, et cetera. I withdrew the crypto out of there to hardware wallets. And from then on, everything went to a trust, so there, there's no tax liability or anything. But can I still answer no, because the initial um, deposit of fiat was from my SSN accounts? No, that's okay. It doesn't matter where the money came from. What I, what I recommend, and I've, I've recommended this since 2017, if you did not get a 1099, say no. Yeah, there's, no, there's nothing coming. I checked with all of the exchanges right. and there's no, Perfect. no coming. Now, if, if you still lose sleep at night from doing that, I see no problem to say yes. It's not a financial question. And if the IRS ever wanted, they could, they could audit you. So I don't see a problem saying yes, because you did not have a tax liability just by buying cryptos. Great. Thank you so much. Yeah. Thank okay. You. Thanks. Good, good question. All right. Uh, Wayne, what do you got? Hey, John, back to basic uh, filing taxes question. I have two daughters, 19 and 18, that have never filed taxes before. But um, of course, they got little jobs. And so they've received a W-2 wage. Do they have to file taxes? I would highly recommend they never do. I don't care if okay. they're withholding and they're going to get money back. Please have them don't do it because they can always learn how to make more money and just consider that cost of being a wage earner. Okay. Right. Okay. Once you, once you get hooked in that system, you it's hard to get out. You know, you're always kind of in that system. And yeah, here's that's... the thing, people, people always say, well, my gosh, John, if, if I try to get a mortgage, they're going to ask me for tax returns. No problem. Right. Do them. Do a tax return. Right. Just don't file it. Don't file it. And on the signature line, you can, you can, get, you can make yourself a stamp that says file copy, or you can right. handwrite it, stamp it down there, and then you give that to the bank. Make a right. scan that. Okay. And I didn't, this, I didn't make this up. This was during the time when these real estate investors, I, I got a lot of help from real estate investors. And I, I called them asking, hey guys, what do I do? <laughs> you know, this, I'm working with a non-filer and that's what they would say. And the bank's happy with that. Um, the other thing you can do is a balance sheet with an income statement. Now, I'm not sure if there's some criteria, like for example, maybe they want a CPA to uh, you know, approve it or something, I don't know. But to make it easy, a 1040 that's not filed, that's stamped file copy, always gets them. That, remember that was in the days that was like 12 years ago when they were doing the not no doc loans they were gearing up for the mortgage crisis <laughs> all right so, okay but, just yeah. just to add on to one of the daughters she has a 1098 t which is a tuition uh payments received for qualified yeah. tuition does right. that matter as well well they're gonna I, it's income and i don't know if it's a, a taxable thing i would assume it is so what do you, what do you what do you think about that? I mean, what are you asking me? Is there a tax liability there? Should should she file taxes based? I mean, okay. based off the W twos, you say you say no, don't don't get them into the system, which I agree with you. Okay. But um, with the ten ninety eight T, does that change anything? No, she can get ten ninety nines all day long. She can right. she can make thirty million dollars a day, and get ten ninety nines for that. As long as she doesn't file ten forty, the IRS will never look at her. And I, I just, I've, I've seen it over the years. I've just, I was shocked when I realized that that's actually how the system worked. So right, yeah, don't cool. file, don't I just file, did. and don't file. Excellent. Thank you. I'll try and get them out of the system. Please. I, I did that with my children. They know. And they're yeah, entrepreneurs. Yeah, they, I mean, yeah. They look at me like I'm crazy too. So, I mean. <laughs> hey, you know, we are. I mean, and they did it to yeah. us because we're married and we have yeah. children. So that's, there you how go. We, that's how we got that. All right. Way. Thanks very much. <laughs> All Bye. right. Sure. All right, so an LLC is creating another person and it's a new person with a fresh start in life, let's call it. And it can do anything as long as, you know, as long as it'll be 
recognized by the state or the government or the laws or whatever, as long as it's not hurting people or breaking laws or you're not using it as a vehicle to break laws or defraud people, yeah, it's a new person and it can do pretty much anything. All right. All right, anybody else? All right, I have a recorded call I have to get on. And it was a joy talking to you guys. I appreciate you joining me on Friday. I hope you all have a really great weekend. I'm going to sign Thank off you. now and I'll, uh, okay, I'm going to post this recording uh, shortly. All right. All righty. Have a good day. Thank you, John. All righty. Bye-bye.